Good evening. Okay. Um. <laughs> That was a big one. In the span of 30 years, Iran has gone from being a trusted ally, the guardian of US interests in the Middle East, one of the pillars of President Nixon's famous twin pillar policy, to a member of Axis of Evil. Since the 1979 revolution and the Islamic hostage crisis, Iran has had an uneasy relationship with the United States, or no relationship at all. And since the riots of this past summer, during the June 12 presidential elections, we can safely say, uh, actually confidently say, that even Iranians have an uneasy relationship with Iran. Who are the Iranians and what do they want? How is their government shaped? And since the deadline for the nuclear deal has come and gone. What are the options facing to the, the United States? With that, I'd like to introduce my wonderful panel, what I affectionately uh, call the royal couple, Christian Amanpour, who is CNN's chief international correspondent for the 18 years of reporting from the front lines of war zones in Kosovo, Somalia, Rwanda, the Gulf states, the first Persian Gulf War, the second Persian Gulf War, Arab. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and many others that I don't remember. She has earned herself nine Emmys for news documentaries. <laughs> Four Peabody's, and most recently in 2007 that I was amazed to read, she was named the commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth herself. <laughs> The other half of this wonderful royal couple is Jamie Rubin. He is the Assistant Secretary of State to Madeleine Albright under the President Clinton's second term. And he was the Chief Spokesperson for the State Department from 1997 to 2000, among other things. Jamie is also an adjunct professor at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. And last but not least, my colleague and dear friend Kareem Sajakpour, a notable Iranian scholar an associate at, at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and the author of the acclaimed book on Khamenei, Reading Khamenei. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Christian, I'd like to start with you. You were there during the uh, riots of the presidential elections. You were on the streets. You spoke with people. You talked to the elected and non-elected officials. How is Iran of June 11th different than Iran of today? Uh, take us through what you saw, how, what you said. Okay. Uh, we got there about a week before the election, and it was a, at the time when it looked like there was going to be a real race. Before, before the week before the election, everybody assumed that President Ahmadinejad would be re-elected with no challenge and with no problem. Then they had these famous televised debates between the candidates. And they really jazzed the country up because they were unprecedented. They put them on TV. Everybody sat down at home and watched them, whether it was Ahmadinejad with, uh, with Mr. Musavi or Mr. Karubi. And it was very, very energetic, unprecedented level of debate between these leaders on Iranian television. And all of a sudden, that and, and, and a lot of the campaign appearances that Musavi had attended with his wife, who, as everybody knows, is a, is a real dynamo and very, very popular and uh, an artist in her own right and you know, a real sort of personality inside Iran. She energized a lot of these rallies. In any event, by the time I got there, I remember very, very well, the first day that I landed and first story I did was going to be these rival um, campaign rallies where the Musavi rally was a human chain from the north of Tehran all the way down to the south, which was the railway station. And obviously, we couldn't follow the entire trail, but I saw a good chunk of it from the north down to, let's say, the center of town. And I didn't really know what to expect because I'd never seen anything quite like that. I'd, I'd covered President Khatami's election campaign, which at that time was the, was the most energetic campaign that had been. And of course, he won. He was the first reform president. He won in a surprise to everybody inside and outside Iran. 
But anyway, so there was this enormous human chain, and that same day, there was a, a competing rally for President Ahmadinejad at a um, sort of like a stadium. And so that went on for the whole week, different, uh, different rallies, different groups. By and large, I think without exception, they were very good natured, they were very you know, fierce competition, but all these people were allowed in the streets and they were literally political debates in the streets. I remember at one of the squares, there was the Ahmadinejad supporters lined up on one side of the square, the Musavi supporters lined up on the other side of the square. There were people driving by with flags. There were, you know, right. we people. all saw that on TV. And and it was, but it was really right. remarkable. Right. So that when we went to the election day, which was a Friday, a, a holiday in Tehran, there were long lines at the polling stations. And everybody said that long lines is going to mean that there's a chance that the reformers are going to win. Right. The last time there was an unprecedented turnout was in 1997 when Khatami won. And People, analysts, people there sort of suggested that that's what was going to happen this time. Um, and then we all know what happened afterwards. You know, the last thing I remember on the day of the election was going to a Musevi press conference where I could, couldn't even get in. It was jam-packed. I could hear his voice. He was somewhere at the other end talking about how we had won. I'm quoting him right. now. And... Um, we, we got back into our car having seen nothing and having tried to get an interview with him, but obviously we couldn't. And we started to drive back and we heard on the radio that in fact the establishment had said no. Ahmadinejad this is how many hours later just well, so that we can this, get a picture okay, this of what's was, happening? This is around 11 o'clock at night. Right. And so people close were to midnight. still voting, or by that time? No, the by that time had it had closed. It okay. closed around 7, 8, 9. Sometimes they kept some of them, you know, So in the span of where. four hours, they decided that Ahmadinejad was the winner. Yeah, and equally in the span of four hours, they uh, decided that Musa declared was the winner, he was right. a winner. So it was, all of a sudden, that was the tension, because, you know, the last time the reformists... <laughs> <laughs> the last time when you come out the reformists said they had won, <laughs> right. they were allowed... To win, right. So in any event, so that started the, the the tension, and for the next several days, it was very, very, very difficult to report. Very tense. Uh, we didn't quite know what to expect. We went out onto the streets the next day, which is Saturday, and that's the day that it that it all started. We were in side streets, in main streets. Um, people were throw. I mean, you know, the the protesters were throwing rocks at the police. There were Molotov cocktails, nice. the police were charging them. By and large, it was mostly kind of good natured the first day. Right. Not good natured, but it wasn't guns, it wasn't, right. you know, that kind of thing. And then it got further and further. Basically more violent. Yeah, more right. violent. Mm -hmm. right. And journalists were unable to do their job. And so the biggest problem for us has been the uh, inability of independent journalists to do their job. Um, every time there's a day of protest or whatever now, the journalists are forbidden from going into the no streets. No to cover it. On a pro-government yeah. protest, the journalists are told to go out and cover it. Right. Um, so you've got journalists being imprisoned, journalists, you know, some particularly local ones being worse than imprisoned. And um, so we're reliant, like all of you, on either personal contacts mm -hmm. or on the social networking. And that, in my view, is not, is not satisfying and it's not right. enough. Right. Uh, Kareem, I want to uh, come back, uh, come to you and then go to Jamie for a policy question since we're still in uh, the political landscape of Iran. Give us a sense of who's ruling Iran. What does the government look like? Who's in power? Is it, as you've argued, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader? Is it the controversial, infamous man, Ahmadinejad? Is it the Revolutionary Guards? Give us, give us a sense of who's ruling Iran. I, I wish I knew the answer to that question myself. <laughs> as best as you can. Yeah. Uh, be, before I answer that, there's a story I know that uh, Vartan Gregorian, who's a real uh, mentor for so many of us likes, I wanted to very briefly share because I think it captures contemporary Iran very well. Um, and this was when I was based in, in Tehran several years back. I was in a taxi, in a Tehran taxi, and I always joke to people that if you base your analysis of Iran on Tehran taxi drivers, you could have predicted a revolution a long time ago because <laughs> Tehran taxi drivers have very difficult jobs. And um, we were driving on this street, and I looked up at the sign, and it happened to be um, um, the, the street called Khaled Islambuli Street. 
and some of you know that Khalil Islambouli is the guy who killed Anwar Sadat. So the Iranian regime, the Islamic Republic, named the street after the assassin of Anwar Sadat because Anwar Sadat was a great friend of the Shah of Iran. And I was curious to get this driver's reaction. I said, do you know who Khalid Islambouli was? He said, no idea. I said, it was the guy who killed Anwar Sadat. And it, he was really outraged, you know, despite the fact that he himself was a former uh, revolutionary who then became disillusioned. He was really outraged and said, you know, Egypt is a great nation. We should have relations with Egypt. What type of government named streets after assassins? And un unintentionally, I got him very worked up. So I said, take the next right. Doesn't matter which <laughs> right, just take the next right. And, he looked up at the street sign. The next street was Bucharest Street, the capital of Romania. And he looked at me angrily and he said, who did this bastard Bucharest kill? <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you know, Christian is talking about the, the popular um, uh, tumult, and I think those of us who had gone to Iran in the past, we always knew this was uh, underneath the surface. Um, and, you know, in terms of who, who uh, runs Iran, I think that uh, the best line, the best analysis of the post-election was done by the late Grand Ayatollah Montezeri, who said the Islamic Republic of Iran is neither Islamic nor is it a republic. Uh, it's a country which, uh, you know, is, uh, it's got this veneer of theocracy. It's ruled by a supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. <laughs> Um, but I think that those of us who have followed Iran over the course of the last decade have seen that the institution of the Revolutionary Guards have really eclipsed the institution of the clergy uh, in terms of their economic uh, influence, their political influence, uh, their foreign policy influence. You look at countries like, you know, you look at what Iran is doing in Lebanon with Hezbollah, uh, with Hamas, the groups there flirting with in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is all the activities of the Revolutionary Guards. And I find it interesting also anecdotally that 10 years ago, if you wanted to brag that you had some connections with the Iranian regime, you would say, well, I know the son or the brother or the relative of such and such cleric. And these days, if you want to brag about the ties you have, you say, you know, I know the brother of this Revolutionary Guardsman. I know the, the, the Revolutionary Guardsman. So, my own take on it is that uh, you have this supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, who um, I would argue is the most powerful individual in Iran, because if you look at the country's most important institutions, uh, the presidency, the, the parliament, the guardian council, the revolutionary guards, all these various Byzantine bodies, they're all led by individuals who are either directly appointed by Khamenei or unfailingly loyal to him. And I think he's ceded enormous legitimacy in the aftermath of these elections. Um, and he, in a way, he, he had a great setup on June, uh, June 11th, uh, before these elections. Uh, because I described him as someone who wielded power without accountability. He had the vast majority of the authority in Iran, but very little of the accountability and the responsibility. When people would complain about Iran in the past, during the Rafsanjani era, they would say, oh, Rafsanjani is corrupt. He hasn't done anything for people. During the Khatami era, they would say, Khatami is weak. He hasn't done anything for people. Ahmadinejad, they would say, in divunas, he's, he's crazy. He hasn't done anything for people. <laughs> and you know, behind the scenes, it was Khamenei with the, the authority. And I think he has he's lost that uh, setup that he had. He's basically been exposed. Um, so I, I do think he remains Iran's most powerful man, uh, but as I said, he's far less supreme than he was prior to the election.